Hey, and welcome to Winning Conversations. We are so glad you are here today. We sat down with a very special couple, Philip and Sedia Pollard. They've been part of our church family for a really long time, and they both serve as leaders on our Restore ministry team. And Restore is a ministry outreach that helps people get free from things that um, have plagued them from a long time. And when you hear their story, you'll understand why they're such an integral part and a vital part of that ministry and team. There are so many reasons why I love this couple. They are truly the salt of the earth. They're people that you wanna be friends with and you wanna get to know and you wanna have them in your corner. And you need that faithful friend to come alongside you and encourage you. Right before we jump into their story, I wanna tell you to stick around for the end because we have a very special announcement on Winnie Conversations. Well, hey, how are you guys doing? Philip and Sadie, are you doing well? Good. Yes, Thank ma'am. you We're so doing much. Good. Restore was where we started connecting. I've kind of like known about the Pollards. I mean, it's kind of one of like, you're one of the the pillar families, I would say, from our perspective as an outside perspective. There's certain families that you see in a lot of places. You know, you see right. you see certain couples that do more than others. And I don't mean that in a good or bad way, but you know what I mean? Like yes. thrive group leaders. Um at the front door, you know, um, engaging in the welcome room. There is just a lot of areas where you continually put yourself to be available for the church and the community. So I always recognize when I see that, because my wife and I, we do a lot of things together. So when I see another couple doing things together, we're just aware of it. And so that's kind of how I first started knowing, like, okay, they're they're in a lot of places. They are. <laughs> I think I met, I, I first met Sedia in the nursery when you served with us and kids. Yes, I, I that's what I met Miss Tanya. Yes, when we came to Heritage of Faith 2016, um, I started helping in the nursery. And that and that year, Miss Tanya was all over the nursery. So that's when we had connection. Yeah. And um, I started serving in the nursery. And then after that, uh, we moved. I moved to the welcome team and started building a team. And I knew exactly who I wanted on the welcome team when we started. And it was you guys. You guys were part of it because you guys are so friendly and you're warm. Is that from your childhood or what do you think? Just connecting with people. Boy, and I remember when you asked us, I did. <laughs> um, pray about it if we wanted to help and then uh, welcome team. And Philip wanted to help in one area here in the church. And because by that time I, w- I was already helping in the nursery. So honestly, Miss Tanya already know this. <laughs> I didn't want to be in the welcome team. Me, I used to tell my kids, when you don't like one thing, the more you do it, the more you're going to like it. Well, that came back to me because I said, oh, Lord, I don't like to. I don't want to be here. So I will, I will be standing in there smiling. But the more I was starting doing it, I started liking it, being the welcome thing. Now I do when we are in the restore and I see new people coming, that comes out of me. Like, oh, welcome, come back. I mean, you're uh, welcome. I'm glad you're here. And I start welcoming them, not knowing I'm doing it. Mm-hmm. But um, yes. The, the fruit of it is there, though. And I know you didn't want to do it. And it was just so sweet to watch you be obedient. <laughs> along the way because it was it was it was a big i i just knew i knew that the lord had told me and uh and the beautiful thing is you're making these really great connections i mean i can think of a couple right now that you connected with without any extra effort it was just so spirit guided they just walked in it was a divine appointment and you all still have connection with that couple and it was because of who you are you know it wasn't all philip Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so it's good, but that's just one of the many ways you serve. Thrive groups are also another way. And then now you have even more reason to be in the nursery. Yes. My granddaughter, but that's the area that I like to serve, I guess the most. I've been doing this since I guess I was a teen, not teenager, a young adult. I like to take care of babies, only babies, not <laughs> up, <laughs> up to three and four. No, because I don't put rules. So they're going to be ending putting rules on me. So I just like the little ones. <laughs> the little ones. It's good. My wife and I do the one to four. That, and we, <laughs> I'm like the babies. I'm like, not even a chance. Not a chance. <laughs> I'll leave that heavy lifting to you. How is, <laughs> how is becoming grandparents been? It's been good. It's been, it's been life changing. It's it's on a different level, so uh, yeah. It's, it's yes, my dad always sending us pictures. She does most every day, and she makes me laugh. I smile when I see those pictures. She's so she's a sweet baby. It's not because she's my granddaughter, but she is. She's always happy, 
and she's very alert. So we we enjoy to be around Allison. That's good. <laughs> uh, just so people make the connection, Allison is Pastor Alex and Asnell's baby. So you guys are the the parents of our youth pastors. Yes, we are. Yeah. And, and you know, there's people they don't know. I the, they they don't know Asnell is our daughter. Uh, not a long time ago, another person was saying, "She's your daughter." I say, "Yes, she." <laughs> now your your daughter and son-in-law are in ministry and obviously in leadership here. You guys are are in leadership, you know, with Thrive Group leadership and store and this, all the areas that you guys serve. Like when you talk to your daughter and your son-in-law, is there ever like because you guys are both leaders spiritually? It, it's, like I'm always curious about what those kind of families are like at home. And and so Alex is like my third son, mm-hmm. and so he, well, he is. He actually calls me dad, and he's and, awesome. Uh, father, he's got they a, call you father. father. <laughs> and um, he has a great dad, uh, Jerry. Is, is a wonderful guy. Yeah, he comes from good stock. He, and, mm-hmm. great and so he sort of left me uh, in charge of and care of. And so I'll wake up some mornings and just have something on my heart, and I'll share it with him and, and just encourage him. Mm-hmm. It'd be real interesting to hear how what, how you got to where you're at now. Yeah. Um, everything, you know, everything started with, you know, I believe somewhere around 91 1991, mm-hmm. we met, and uh, I just got out of jail, and uh, I lived with my brother and said, hey, let's go to church, and this little Hispanic church, I'm thinking, why are we, anyway, so we went to this church, and it ended up being um, Calvary Cathedral, what, Nichols, uh, Bob, Bob, Nichols, Bob Nichols, his original church, which was across the street from Brother Copeland, A.W. Copeland's insurance office where Dr. Savell had his first, anyway. So when he talks about having the office in the hallway, that was was the building across the street. We know which building they're talking about. Right, we We know know. which building they're talking about. So that's where I met her, and uh, we we became. He came, he came to our, to my church. Like Like he said, it was a little Hispanic church, and he came with his brother, his friend, and by the second time, because we used to have our youth services on Fridays, and it was a large um, youth, remember? Oh, yeah, youth and young people. Yes, so anyway, he comes, and ours was Love at the First Sight. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, it was uh, Love at the First Sight, so I didn't know how to speak English. I hardly speak English. So and, on, you spoke Spanish before you met her? A little bit, a little if bit. She didn't speak, if she didn't speak English, <laughs> you figured out. That's what I was, I, I always, she says I didn't. I always but, thought you learned Spanish because of. You're I saying, took, I, I, and that's another story. But I had a desire at eight years old. I actually started learning Spanish when I was real young and learned words and then took it in high school. That's and awesome. then, um, so there's always a desire. You knew you were going to meet her. You right. need that skill set. <laughs> Lord's like, I need so, to learn some Spanish. So, yeah, we read it wrote it and he only and, uh, he only knew a little bit but after we got married he became way better in his spanish he can speak read and write spanish i still struggle with pronunciation i know the words but i it's hard for me english is hard it's a lot of sound so i'm speaking my whole life i'm not very good at it either so <laughs> don't it, like it is hard <laughs> yes it is hard i mean there's people when they are around philip and he starts speaking spanish one time they told him, remember they told you, you are Mexican, but you look white. And then he says, no, <laughs> I am white. But he can speak Spanish with no accent, really good. So when he writes me like Valentine's Day or, or anniversary, a car, he writes it in Spanish. Oh. He does good. He's good in writing and reading Spanish. And of course, speaking, he don't have no accent. So That's yes, awesome. we met. He came to my church, like I said. We met, and then by a year later, we got married, right? 92. In 92, we got married. We, got mar- we met in September 19th, I think, 91. Mm-hmm. And then we were married uh, July 25th, 1992. 92. <laughs> yes. So, uh, but it was also rainbows and skittles out of the gate. Oh, perfect yeah. marriage, <laughs> no problems. They're all stars all right? the way. Right? <laughs> They've been, you know, sailing high since. <laughs> So tell us what the transition was. I know you guys met at church, but that wasn't always part of your story, right, Philip? No, 
I don't know. So was it 97? It was 97. So that's four or five years. Went to church there, and we had a tragedy happen uh, and uh, nearly lost my whole family. And so she was held at gunpoint. Uh, they held my son at gunpoint. Uh, they tried to take my truck, or they did take the truck, and I had a show truck, had a truck. They wanted it, so they got it. And uh, I got, uh, you know, I got an offense. I quit going to church. I was halfway in at that point, and I just, you know, didn't really have a, a an encounter with God up until that point. Uh, raised in church, stepped away from it, came back, and then I just left totally and uh, went, actually went into a, a whole different world um, to where they were my safe haven and and uh, literally lived another life that, that I don't talk about a whole lot because it would just glorify the devil. But uh, when I came back, fast forward, was Father's Day of 2009. Um, drugs, alcohol, just the whole gamut. Uh, mm-hmm. Drugs took me to a dark place real quick and a darker place. And, and so I got with all this stuff that the devil uses, you know, just I really just wanted to die, and uh, but I knew I'd leave these guys, and so held me on for a long time. But I'd, I'd already talked about just taking my motorcycle and running it into a concrete pylon. I, I'd thought about it many times, and uh, this one night, uh, Father's Day night, and uh, our youngest son, he was at camp, a church camp, and. Um, well, on Friday night, so the day before, he had asked for prayer for me. And um, little did I know, 200 miles away, you know, this kid, little 10-year-old kid, you know, is, is getting prayer for his dad. And um, that next day and that night, um, there was a pastor my dad had met, Randy Hardesty. Two weeks prior to this back up, I was in a hospital room, and uh, actually, I called my dad. And I, he had, at that time, they were taking care of my youngest daughter, and my mom and dad were. And he came over, and I was in—I was bedridden. I was in bed for about four days, trying to beat this, and the drugs had just shut all my organs down. And, and I asked him, I said, "Can you get me to the hospital?" And he said, "Yeah." And so him and my two sons took me to the emergency room at Baylor. And, of course, I knew what they were going to tell me. And so this, he called this pastor up while I was in the room. And he, you know, uh, he said, yeah, I met your dad. And I, f- I remember just being really rude to him, uh, a lot of explicitives. And he said, can I leave my card? So he left his card, and he prayed over me and left. And two weeks later, I called him on midnight on Father's Day night. And he called me back. He didn't answer. He called me back. He said, hey, I just rolled in two weeks on vacation. I'm literally in the driveway. We just rolled in. Give me about five minutes and I'll come get you. He literally, his family got out of the truck and he came and got me. And so that next we didn't get anywhere that night. You had to be suicidal or for them to take you with no insurance. So I got in the next morning and um, I didn't have any money, no insurance, nothing. And my dad ended up paying for me to get into uh, to a rehab facility. And uh, that's where it all started. Um, that's where your healing start? That's where, first you have to quit, stop the bleeding. I mean, you got to put a tourniquet on. Uh, gotcha. you, okay. you, you have to quit doing, quit putting in your body what's destroying you first. It just doesn't work. You've got to quit the bleeding. If you, if you want to get off something, first thing is you got to quit doing it. And that was the first step for you? That was the first step. Okay. Now, I'd already left alcohol. And I've already left a lot of stuff on my own without any help. But drugs was was a, was a hard one. Uh, but it let me, det- des- you know, in there, I met a guy uh, whom they used. He was doing his internship to be in LCDC. So he had to do 4,000 hours. Jay. We'll just call him Jay. And uh, I knew him out in the streets. And so he had been sober off methamphetamines for about four and a half years, and he helped me. And so uh, he talked to me in a way that just he'd been where some of the places I had been. 
And uh, he said, you got to, you, there's certain things you have to do. You have to get this out. And he taught me ways to do it to where you don't give names. And there's just, you have to get that stuff out. You have to. Because anytime you put that on top of, you put good stuff on top of bad stuff, you know, it's, so I do believe that, that us helping other people, there's a, uh, it's a lot of weight. It, it goes a long way. It helps a whole lot when, when someone's restoring mm-hmm. or being restored. Um, just the words I understand or I've been there, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it goes a long way. So yeah, my kids were raised, uh, my boys were raised around that. They were, uh, clubhouses and just crazy life. Mm-hmm. Um, one was 10, one was 14 when all of it stopped. But, uh, I actually got out of that about nine months before, uh, I, I got sober and, uh, 11 days after I got out of that, there was a 56-man roundup with six sealed indictments anywhere from San Francisco to El Paso to Laredo. And everybody, I mean, 11 days, everybody's in, in, in life or doing life. And you were spared. I walked away from it. DEA come up to me. It's the mercy of God. The mercy of God. I can tell you a story. I was at the Harley shop. And I still wasn't. <laughs> I was nowhere near saved. I mean, I was making a drop off and uh, one foot in, one foot out. I'm not with this, but I'm not with this type deal. And and a DEA agent approached me. And at 11 o'clock in the morning, there's no one at the Harley shop. He parks right beside me guy with tattoos and all this stuff, and he tells me who he is. And um, I said, well, I forget what I told him. I'm sure it wasn't nice. And I said, well, just know that if we're anywhere in public, I'll tell everybody who you are. I forget what I told him. It was just so. Right. So I leave, go one way, and he leaves and goes another way, and we meet. And he was in the middle of a cavalcade doing a bust, with I don't know how many unmarked cars. They turned the corner, and he was on his bike, and there was all these cars, and they were going, and they passed me to go do the bus. Mm -hmm. And so things like that. Uh, There were some other instances there on the end to where, uh, I mean, there's, there's no way I should be here. When I first got sober, of course, the counselors, everybody, they had me telling my story like within 30 days. But I never could. I mean, I always would. I tried the story the wrong way one time. And it was basically people wanting to know who did I know, you know, so-and-so. And and I was like, man, I don't don't want to. So from there on out, which I've given it in prison, I've given it in rehab all over, and I always let God talk. So where he's taken me is from I had to start just start serving and quit talking. And then he says, okay, now I brought you back. Or when you talk now, you give me all the glory. And you can basically, you, you've got a, a hall pass to talk about certain things with grace. Mm-hmm. So when I mention any of this, it's with grace. Absolutely. It's, it's, so it's never to, you know, one of these or a pat on the back. or sure. it's No, it's what he's pulled me out of. And, and, so, and I still have somewhat of a difficult time to talk about some of it. Which And, and let me tell you something he did for me. He erased my memory. I, I just don't remember half of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she can tell you, because it, it bothered me. I'd wake up and I'd have blood on me and she'd be in another part of the house and, and I'd be fight night and I'd fight myself. And I, I, mean, I've, I did that for years. And so I've dealt with a lot of stuff. So when I say restored, I know what it takes. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. I definitely know what it takes. And so if there's certain, if there's some of these key things here, one of them is still thinking you're a victim. You will never get restored. You and I don't care what you've been through, what kind of childhood, it's not worth dragging. You have to get to the point where it's not worth dying for. And that a victim will never be a volunteer. Mm-hmm. A victim is always look what they did to me. A volunteer says, Look what I did to myself. Yes, this happened and created circumstances that I I had an action. I had a choice. But this is what I chose to do. And that way, it almost, it's not that you can take care of your own sins, but it's to say, hey, I'm here. 
I was wrong. I'm not sorry. I was wrong. How do I make this right? And if you do that enough, it reshapes the mind to say, okay, I don't want to do that. Okay, well, I need to start living this type of life. And and that's what really I had good mentors. I had guys that said, you're going to be a doer, not a talker. Don't be an accomplished talker, be an accomplished doer. So when I speak now, it's because of what I'm filled with. And so when God saved me, he totally saved me. But I told him, I said, hey, take my life or give me life. But I, I want it to happen now. I'm that miserable. I want something that works. And so I know God is greater than any drug that's out there. Is he greater than any addiction out there? But we have to allow him to work in our lives. And it's like telling the painter, no, nope, only paint half the car. Yeah. What? No, you want the whole thing painted. You want the whole thing redone. You want the whole thing restored. Oh, yeah. And so because any of that, just a speck of rust coming back will ruin that whole paint job. So if you you can't put, it's like when somebody gets, in my opinion, when they get saved and they get in radically saved and something has happened, there's a, and then get them to serve in quick. Maybe, maybe not up front, but get them to, because that's when, when you're using your hands, helping people is when I feel like God reaches in there while you're not looking because you're not worried about yourself. You're, you're thinking about somebody else and he gives you a new heart. I agree but, with that. But that my new heart that. happened here at Heritage of Faith, and I hope it's okay, Joe, but Joe Makrowski, he came over during the middle of a, a service. I mean, actually, my youngest son was beside me, and I, I was just I had my eyes shut, and I looked up, and he's right in front of me. He says, can I pray for your heart? And he, we were on the other side of the church at that time, and Big Tony was there with him. And so, yeah, and so he prayed for me and my son, and I didn't really feel anything. Be honest with you, I left service. I was Sunday. Come back on Wednesday. When I came back in the sanctuary, it buckled me to my knees, and I knew I had a new heart. And I never, which I knew I had a new heart when I got saved. But there were some things sure. I was still hanging on to. Right. You know, I can go into my dad's relationship and how God restored that. That was a total restoration. When something is restored, it does not look like the old. Yeah, in I, any way. I think the word is real clear. Like a new creation is a new creation. That means that all the old has passed away, is dead. Well, and, and you have to choose to revive that old guy. But you don't. You have a new heart. This is who I am now. And if you'll do that, instead of focusing on changing other people to make the relationship work, because that's not restored. When you focus on yourself and then go into those old situations and those old, uh, you know, like my dad, you know, his greatest fear was that I was going to bring something up. My greatest fear is that he wasn't going to act like I wanted the way him to act. But when we were both changed and restored, none of that came up. And so once the gate was open, I mean, it was it was they were open and they stayed open. And uh, I got to be you know actually do some really cool stuff with him. And uh, but did I change him as a person? No. And he had been through it with his dad, so he was more ready than I was. The dad is always more ready than the son because it is it is generational. And so he has dealt with his dad on it. He knows how it affects people and affects, and so he's more ready to get rid of it than the son. That's good. But it, both people have to be ready. So during this, we'll say season, <laughs> this, this restoration process, obviously he's going through his restoration process, but it's not like you're not, you're not just sitting back passively like what is your experience through this this struggle well for me i never did drugs alcohol but i know what it is to live with someone like that yeah and i eat damage it did brought damage to our marriage because when i met philip you you all just heard what he said if you don't surrender at all you just put a bandage that's why it happened to us we both come for families, broken families, dysfunctional families. Uh, so, you know, Philip always been very um, bold and brave to do and to say things. So what it happened with him, you know, you just heard he said he just got out of Yale. So I met him, we got married, and probably only the three years the three or four years of a marriage, everything was fine because he was trying. 
like making it as but like he didn't surrender all after that he's philip used to be a heavy heavy drinker he used to drink matter of fact he showed up um and to asanels and my son alejandro when i was delivering them drunk he was drunk so from there like i said i create my own world and um it was just me and the kids and you know the less i wanted to get pregnant the more I got pregnant. I know how, but <laughs> I didn't want to get pregnant. And <laughs> You're like, do I want to bring more kids in? And now I know. So we ended up having four kids. My world was moved by how he was living. So you know how it is. First it starts bad, and then it turns. Uh, first it's not start not good. That's how he started our marriage. And then it started bad. And then it went from bad to worst. That's when he started doing drugs. And um, the restoration for me is that God, yes, healed my heart and restored my mind. The day he surrendered his life to God, his mother came to me. And he says, the Lord said that I need to give you this scripture. Speak the scripture over Philip. And that's Ezekiel 36, um, 26, where God says, and I will give you a new heart, and I will take away the heart of stone. Heart of stone, because that's how he was. Phil was very rebellious. You you've told me before that that culturally, divorce wasn't an option, right? No, no. So you were sticking in it through thick and thin, really. Yes, because you know my culture is once you get married, it's forever. Yeah. So this is this is our culture. So. You know, I was there, like, not a long time ago, how Pastor was preaching, and he says, when you don't know how to stop, you want to stop, but you don't know how. Me, I didn't want to quit, but I didn't know how to help Philip. We both brought things uh, to our marriage that we left in our childhood, and instead of help each other, we broke more. How do you say each other more? I broke him more, and he broke me more. Mm -hmm. So we were there. There were times that I guess it's just because our children, but we were living there together, but we were not together. So after he became, you know, he surrendered his life, I started speaking that word that my mother-in-law gave me. That was my encounter with the word of God. So for me, that was an encounter after, you know, starting speaking that word over Philip. And then he, the day he decided, yeah, it's a long story with him, but he decided that he wanted to surrender his life. And because his family came around and told him, you are sick and you need help. So that's the <laughs> night, that's the night, the night before Father's Day. It was 2009, a day before Father's Day, he uh, decided to go to a rehab center. And like you, you heard what he said, we didn't have no money. That's when he went to rehab, and the process of restoration, that's when it begins, going to the rehab center, and then um, by that time, like I said, Philip didn't want to go to church, so he relapsed after three months being sober. So again, God spoke to me. I went to this um, corporate prayer and while I was there, this lady comes to me, and you know, in my own language, she says, the Lord says he wants you to be the wise woman that builds your house. And then it's, and then she says, the Lord wants you to be that woman. So, and then she stepped, she, you know, she moves from there, and then I'm like, okay, what did I do wrong? Because I took it wrong. I said, I think, I thought that it was me that everything happened with him, you know, all the issues of addictions that he had since we got married. Like I said, he only hold it for three, three or four years. So I said, Lord, okay, what did I do wrong? What, do, what, do, what do I, I've been here in my house with my kids, but I took it wrong. Yes, yeah, so it took me like two, three weeks praying, reading my Bible. And then God took me to Isaiah 32, 18, where he says, uh, then my people shall rest in peaceful habitation. I'm trying to say it in English because I read my Bible in Spanish. And there was another encounter with me with the Word of God because I made it personal. I said, Lord, me and my husband, we live in a house there where there's peace. 
you know, I, I heard last week um, Heather and Brother Trey talking about, you know, I heard Brother Trey, uh, Trey crying, you know, seeing the transformation on, on Heather. And I feel related because only the person that lives with someone that has so many addictions, yeah, you get traumatized. You heard me, Danny, when I said, probably you were dead and dead, restored, when I said, after he became so sober, so me, personal, dealing with so much fear that he would relapse again. So that's why God spoke to me the second time, using this lady in that church saying that I had to be wise. When God spoke to me through that scripture, I said, okay, Lord, Philip could have never be in home and relax, sitting in the couch. I used to tell him, why can't you just sit down and relax? He couldn't. He suffered so much anxiety. So he used to come home late, leave in the morning really early, because like I said, he always been self-employed. So that was my life with him. When I started speaking that word, uh, you know, my son, the middle one, he will whisper in my ear, Mom, are you sure that is not under the influence of drugs? And I used to say, no, no, he's not. And that's when the word of God took place in his life. And from day, day four, this is uh, September the 3rd, right? When you became sober, 2009, from that day four, Philip has been sober. So, um, Praise the, God. so yes, God restored my, the way I used to think <laughs> and, um, and it brought me restoration to my heart. I don't feel fearful, uh, where he is, what he's doing or how he's going to come home. Right. So that's gotta be nice. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, you I'm guys, telling you, <laughs> you guys spent a lot of time with your previous church. Yes. Connect connect the dots between that church and then coming here and what God's done now that you're at Heritage. Oh, it's a big difference for us when we talk about how we've been planted in here and how our lives have changed a lot. We do talk about We came in 2016 because uh, some people that we knew, they were already members in here. So our kids, Asenel, Alejandro, and Andres, they were part of the youth. So the other people was here, invite them. So they started coming on Wednesdays. And we were on the other church, and they were over here. So by the time, like I said, things started getting better over there. The um, New Year's Eve, which it was going to be 2016, we had a person that used to come to our church here, Heritage of Faith, came to our house. We made a dinner and that person called and said, hey, can I bring a couple? I'm going to say who it is. Uh, they became friends with me. I would like y'all to meet this couple. Like I said, we were still there over there in the other church. Well, that, that was Brother Vic and Rochelle. And Brother Vic says, when we talk about this, he said, I didn't want to come. <laughs> he was <laughs> like, no, I don't want to go. I don't know these people. And Philip was like, and we, didn't, we were like, but we don't know who's that people that is coming. So we say, okay, they can come. So they come. We, like I said, we were uh, celebrating the, um, you know, the New Year's Eve, which it right. was going to be 2016. And when he came, I'm going to let Phil say what Brother Vic told you. He gave you a prophetic so, word. So, yeah, so they showed up about 1130. Yes. So right before midnight. They were going to come, so they decided to come, him, Rochelle, and Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And so I had a, I just smoked a lot of barbecue, had briskets, ribs, and so I put him a plate together, and it was like when he came through the door, it was like, here, sit down, and we just instantly hit it off. And um, and so he said, you know, I, don't, I feel to tell you, your mission is accomplished where you're at, and it might be time for a new season. Mm. And so that was Friday night. Sunday, we went to our church. And we were there in the foyer, me and my kids and her. And they, like, like she said, our kids were already coming here for the youth. And um, we said, well, they're having a night of worship. So we came on the night of worship. And I think the next night, Monday night, we went to the founders and of the church. 
that had taken it over. And by this time, they were in their late 80s, maybe even 90. And they took this church back over, and we turned in our keys. And so we made the move, but we wanted to leave right. And so anyway, we left. And so the first Sunday in January of 16, we were here. I think it was January 3rd. Yes. We were here. And that was the year of the prophetic word. Second or third. The great, is it? The great. Breaking loose. The great mm -hmm. breaking loose. So I still had that. Um, Marker. Yes. Because for I, us, it was the great break, breaking loose. Breaking loose. I remember meeting you guys that day. I don't know if you know that. I remember meeting you guys your first Sunday. Well, we came, like he said, the um, night of worship. Night of worship. Right. And we knew that, that this that was... We walked in and said, this is so it. So we walked the next Sunday morning, and Pastor uh, Rick was coming out of the sanctuary. We were walking, and you know how there, our church has a lot of greeters. Honestly, we were... Our hearts was broken from the other uh, church. And as soon as we walk in, they welcome us so good. They... They make us, how do you say, they make us feel loved. And I told our pastors, that love, they, they show us that day. The greeters, uh, the, you know how you were walking. Mm -hmm. um, that love make us to come back because we said, okay, we're going we're gonna to see. Uh, we're going to see if this is our church. That day we knew this was our church. So we've been planting since 2016 and here. That's so cool. And... Your guys' story, I I love, it gives me such hope and joy when I know that there's couples like yourselves that have gone through so much, but clearly the, the, the fruit of your pursuit after him is now, you know, like it could have easily been in that season of like, forget it. Like, it's not worth it. You know what I mean? Like say your culture did encourage divorce or say, you know, there wasn't that pursuit for restoration or that desire for it. But because of that, like, but God, you know, but God, now what you, who you're able to minister to personally for your story and for your story, who you're able to reach professionally, you know, what God's restored. Talk about restoration, like brand new. I mean, you made a statement the other day. You said... <laughs> You used to you used to have please looking for you. Now they work for you. <laughs> you say that. How did you say it? Well, yeah. I mean, we when we were part of that world, they would just pull us over to inventory us, see if we got new tattoos, if we had new patches. If I'm serious, I mean, that we get we get pulled over to, and then put everything back together. I mean, I don't say harassed. I mean, they were doing their job, and we were doing ours. I mean, that's the best way I can put it. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't on the right side, and they were. And so fast forward, yeah, now I've got a couple that work for me, and only God can do that. And he makes those relationships and trust. Uh, it, it, you know, like I said, they were doing their job, and, and I was living my life. And, and uh, here's the deal. Broke, uh, hurt people normally hurt other people. Restored people help other people restore. And that's our main goal in life. Not that they won't make the same mistakes we did, but that they know there's an, there's another way. There's something you can do. And the way I look at it, I'm going to live to 100, so I'm half time. So my second half looks way better than my first half. And it's not that you made a mistake once. People say, oh, he'll, it's, you, sometimes you make mistakes multiple times, and you have to understand something. You know, he, he's there every time. It's not that he'll give you a chance. He gives us many chances. <laughs> and, and and so it's really when when you look when the desire to look for something else uh is it's like when the it's like when the teacher appear the student appears, the teacher is there. But the desire has to come from within. And uh I love Hosea four two, you know, my people perish because I can knowledge. And it goes on to say they actually perish for rejection of knowledge. So you've got ignorant and hard-headed there. And so I, I, I simplify everything. And, and so basically I didn't want to be ignorant. And ignorant can be fixed. Hard-headed comes from within. And so a lot of times, you know, depending on the way you think and the way you live, you literally have to hit bankruptcy on every level before you'll say, okay, uncle, 
you know, I need some help. But well, I mean, like <clears throat> for my background, it was always management and training. But you always say I, I can train you a skill. I can't train you an attitude. You can't. I can't teach it. You can't teach desire. I can teach anyone to do anything, right. but I can't give you the attitude for it. No. And so having a heart for restoration, having a heart for wanting to do better, having a, like get in the word, get in the Lord, get into what he has for you. No one else could do that. The best thing you can do for restore is live it. And you've heard the cliche, you can't, you can lead a horse water, you can't make them, can't make them drink, but you can make them thirsty. Mm -hmm. And your life will make somebody thirsty. I never talk about church. They always ask, where do you go to church? They want to know where I'm getting this information. That's exactly what they want to know. And I tell them it's simple. Oh, you, get to, you can find this on YouTube. And, and so whether or not they come or not, that seed's planted. And so once you're a sower, you, it's all about the seed. Sow the seed and move on. If not, you're getting ready to get your feelings hurt because <laughs> they're going to do something or not do something that you don't like when that has nothing to do with it. You don't make that seed grow. You plant it and move on. I, I guess you all have heard me say the best deliverance I came from was people. I just, yeah, just my gear to really care about what somebody thinks. Now, I try to treat them with love, but have you ever tried to treat a victim? They're going to be victimized no matter what you do. You didn't do this right. You didn't do that right. And so I, you have to be led. There's no way that we started this off by being led, and there's that is the only way. And I just love where we're at because the whole place is led from the front door to the back. To the everything is is top notch, and so we want to be a part of something like that. That really leads into kind of our our signature question here at the end, because you guys are you guys are winning in so many areas. You're flourishing. Besides being part of Restore, you guys lead a healthy, vibrant, th thrive group. That's our small groups. For those who don't know, you guys are doing a lot, and you're making a lot of difference in people's lives in those one on one relationships. The theme of our house, kind of that's imprinted on our hearts and all over the building, is making winners in life. What, when you hear that statement, what does that mean to you? What does it mean to be a winner in life? Well, like I said, when I first sobered up, there was there was three questions I asked myself every day: How free do I want to be? How bad do I want it? And what am I willing to do to get it? And every day I did something working towards that, and that's how I'm restored today. So winners in life means being free you can't be a winner without being free something is a boat anchor to you that you've got to cut loose and a guy told me like this he says if you're doing something or living a life that you don't like the way it's making you feel he said you have two options learn to learn to like the way it makes you feel or quit doing it that's how simple this is you have to quit the bleeding. You have to quit whatever it is that's killing you before you can start living. And that's, it's like you have to take the virus out of the mainframe before you can put anything good in it. Mm -hmm. You have to clean that thing out as far as computer goes. And I'm not a computer guy, but that's as much as I know about that's it. That's good. You have to clean it out to put new information. If you put that on top of old information, it will mess up the information. It'll mess anything up that you put on top of. So making wonders in life is we like taking people that that have that that are willing um, and they have a desire for the better things. Even the guys that work for us, um, I mean, I always ask them two questions: Can you follow instructions? Can you pay attention? And really, that's if you if we will follow Christ like that, we will be winners because awesome. everything will fall off of us. So just pay attention to Him and know who's leading. For me, um, making winners in life is, like he said, if you restore, you will give fruit. Did it make sense what I said? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you can be planted in the best place, but if you're not restored, how are you going to give fruit? So for me, that's if you restore, you will be successful in life. In every area of your life, if you restore, you will become winner in life. This is awesome. These conversations are 
why we have this podcast, just to have amazing conversations with amazing people that are in our church. So thank you both for being here and doing this. Um, yeah, thank you. Like it's, it's, thank you to you. I love your guys' story and your heart and where you're at now. And I could not be happier that we could just share the same community together and just be a part of that. So all those who are listening, uh, thank you so much for listening. I want to encourage you all that if you do not have a Thrive group, you should definitely check out the Pollard's Thrive group. It's an amazing Thrive group. Um, we will have show notes for that, as well as if anyone who needs restoration, and they've obviously in this podcast was a big theme about talking about that and how important that is. And it's not just restoration from a, a drug or alcohol, but any kind of stronghold or any kind of situation that's keeping you from being where you need to be. These guys lead our leadership teams of our restore meetings that happen every Friday night here at our church. And we just highly encourage you to to either come see them in the lobby or come see them on a Friday night and sharing what they have to offer, like their wisdom, their experience, and most importantly, their love, their heart for others. So it, we, we highly encourage anyone who's in that situation or feels like it, please come and join them and take part in this opportunity to be restored because it is a beautiful thing to see a couple walking it out, living it out daily, this restoration process and the joy of it. It's so, it's so awesome. So thank you so much for listening. We are so thankful for the Pollards and their heart. Um, I hope you were really touched by their story. Like I said at the beginning, we are excited for what God is doing. Um, we are wrapping up. We're coming to the end of our first season. And so far, we've only been on an audio platform. But we are moving up. God has taken us to the next level. It's been line upon line everywhere we go. And we are going to be moving to video platform. So look out for sneak peeks and... Uh, new social media handles and all the things that you can stay connected with winning conversations with our host team um, our media team has been working hard in the background so we are excited to bring you another way to catch up with these incredible people that go to Heritage of Faith are connected are partners with our ministry and we want to bring it to a wider audience and we're really excited about what God is doing so we'll catch you next time on winning conversations and look forward for more content in video form. Yay! Love y'all. Bye.